I'm Alice Belgrade, and I am going to be talking to you about a slightly different angle to the AHC experience, which is more of a moment-to-moment, -moment, day to day grind of getting through our lives, surviving our daily routines in a way that helps build positive behavioral repertoires, positive behaviors. I want to say a word about personality, because sometimes we think of behavior and personality as the same thing. Actually, what is personality? It's a repertoire of frequent behaviors. Kids are not born with a personality. That's the good news. They're born with certain tendencies to respond to things in their environment in specific ways. And those tendencies I like to call temperament. So kids are born with different temperaments. And even kids who all may share that AHC diagnosis are going to have different temperaments, very different temperaments, based on who they are genetically, who their parents are, what their early, early life experiences are. But what makes a personality is how those tendencies develop into patterns of responding. So today, I'm going to talk to you about basic principles of behavior. It's funny, we have like an empty <laughs> project, and then you. <laughs> um, we're, I'm going to talk about basic patterns of behavior. We need to understand how behavior functions with typical human beings in order to understand how AHC influences and affects that relationship between behavior and the world. So I'm going to start out with a little story. And it's a story about an old master teacher back in the 1800s. And he had his little six-year-old students at his feet. And he told the little six-year-olds, life is like you have two wolves, one on each shoulder. And one wolf is mean, aggressive, greedy, evil, vicious. And the other wolf is patient, kind, caring, and loving. And they're fighting with each other for who's going to be dominant. And one little boy raises his hand and he said, well, teacher, which one wins? And the teacher says, the one you feed. And to me, that is a parable for the whole behavior analytic worldview. That story exemplifies a particular technique and intervention that I'm going to give you today that I hope then becomes so much a part of how you operate with your family, with your children, even with your coworkers. And it's called differential reinforcement. And we're going to come back to that, because that's the intervention that is the core of what I want to teach you today. But there's some first things first. First, we need to understand the basics of how behavior operates in the typical world. Why do people do what they do? So without further ado, I'm not used to using a mic. Can I just want to see some. I have to use the mic in order for that. Okay. Well, that says it all. <laughs> that clip I show every time because it encapsulates almost everything we need to know about behavior, the course of behavior, how behavior develops, what we do about it, what goes right, and what goes wrong. 
So in that little clip, we're going to learn a lot. I asked for this little easel. Oh, dear, they're all connected. OK, this is like not cute. Play the trick. OK. So in that clip, anybody familiar with that movie, Terms of Endearment, with Shirley MacLaine? OK. So what I want to use is that clip to teach you in a few minutes a whole graduate course <laughs> in behaviorism. We're obviously not going to get there. But we have to know a certain set of basics. And those basics is that there is a lawful relationship between what people do and what the world gives back and how that actually develops or shapes whole repertoires of behavior. And it all can be kind of looked at as a typical learning curve. So we're going to analyze that little episode. And from there, we're going to understand how the specifics of kids with AHC affect this typical sequence of behavior. So the first part is to know that anybody here hear of the ABCs of behavior, the three-part contingency where you have to fill out behavior and they say, OK, what's the antecedent? What's the behavior? What's the consequence? We're going to talk a little bit about that. So the basic sequence of people acting in their world can be simplified as a, an equation here. It's like we're going to make little arrows. ABCs. It's called the three-part contingency. And Skinner, B.F. Skinner popularized this in 1938. So it's real recent. Right? It's been around a long time. And many, maybe it's just really, I would say, thousands of articles that support this three-part contingency. What's interesting is that the new behavior analysts have come up with another part, a fourth part, that goes before the sequence, called motivating operations. Why do I bring it up? Because this is where AHC comes into play. Kids with AHC are kids. They're children. And we have to remember that every single moment. And the world acts upon them and their behavior similarly to everybody else. And yet we know that somehow it's different. And that somehow kids with AHC seem to be triggered differently or more or more frequently in different ways. And so it actually all happens right here. And I'm going to explain how AHC then affects the outcome of this, the rest of this sequence. So let's look at the ABCs of this terms of endearment. The B is behavior. I always start with the behavior. So what was the, let's talk about what was the pinnacle of the undesired behavior that you saw, the outburst. What, what, what did that look like? The pinnacle of Shirley MacLaine's behavior. She, was, she had a huge outburst, screaming. Right, let's just call that our rage burst, a rage outburst. We're going to call it a rage burst. That was what it all kind of climbed to. But if we look at the, I'm going to call this, here's the burst. Here's her rage right here. The antecedent. What actually set it all in motion? She just didn't come tearing out there, I think I'm going to have a big burst. Something in the environment triggered her outburst. What it was, since we're in a different kind of setting here, I'm going to give you the, I'm going to ask an answer. What it was is that it got to be 10 o'clock, and her daughter had not gotten her pain medication yet. So here it is, it's 10 o'clock, no medication. Let's go back for a minute. And look at the motivating operations in this little clip. This is a mother whose daughter has terminal cancer and is suffering greatly. She has three young children that will not have a mom. She's going through a divorce. I think she might already be divorced by then. Her daughter is in pain with a terminal illness. Can you imagine the anxiety and distress that the Shirley MacLaine character is under? Those are motivating operations. She doesn't just come to the nurse's station like, you know, oh, I think I'd like a cup of coffee. Where can I find that? 
she's under emotional distress because of an actual event in their lives, and that's the terminal illness. That prompts the fact that that makes the 10 o'clock time and the no medicine, that becomes extremely important. She goes over to the nurse's station, right? She goes to the nurse and she says, okay, it's past 10 o'clock, it's time for my daughter's shots. Here's the important thing, and if you leave here today, and this is all you can remember, this is it. When she asks for the shot, which is critically important to her daughter's well-being, what does the nurse do? Yes, yeah, exactly. This lady says, just a minute, just a minute. I was going to, just a minute. She blocked her. She put the stops, the brakes on. That blocking is the core trigger to tantrums, rages, demanding, inappropriate behavior. Not episodes now, but behaviors that are voluntary and in the control of the child. Any typical child blocking an intense agenda. I need that shot. I'm, the lady's saying, they're saying, in a minute, meaning you're not getting it. Not right now. What happens with the, Shirley McLean's behavior is what happens with your child, with any child. It's a very well-documented response to being thwarted or blocked in your effort to obtain something that's important to you. And that is two things that I want you to, you might even want to write these down. I'll put them up here. She does two things. She escalates and she persists. When the woman says, in a minute, does the Shirley MacLaine character say, oh, okay then, yeah. You have a big chair where I can lounge until it's time, till you're ready? Absolutely the opposite. When she's blocked, she goes to the next person, kind of like, mom said no, let's ask dad. Dad says no, let's ask grandma. That's a very typical pattern, is it not? When a child gets the answer no, what do they do? They go to another source. They persist and they don't reduce behavior, behavior escalates. She gets more intense. She goes to the next one. She's louder. She starts pounding on the nurse's counter. And what happens with the second nurse? Not my patient. It's even worse. Ma'am, she's not my patient. Oh my gosh, she didn't even say it a minute, right? Big blocking. She keeps escalating until finally, blocked, blocked, blocked. You're not getting it. I'm delaying you. She finally has this huge rage burst at the top of her lungs. Now, if she continued to be blocked, and this is important, her behavior would extinguish, meaning it would reduce to the point of disappearing. That could take a very long time. This is a typical tantrum course of events. If it's not responded to long enough, the person will eventually either tire out, fall asleep, give up. That could take a very long time. And it always escalates to the point often of danger, of aggression, of disruption first. So typically, those things are not ignored. Can you imagine in a school setting, everybody ignoring that? No, not going to happen. So extinction is very rare. We don't see it that much, and we don't do it that much. What happened in the clip is what typically happens in life, and that is what happened when she had the huge burst. She got her way. In fact, that last nurse jumps up and runs into the room and gives her the shot. So she gets 
the shot. How many of you are familiar with the term functional assessment of behavior from the schools usually? Some of you, a couple of you. Well, a functional assessment of behavior is an inquiry into the reasons why a child is misbehaving. What's the payoff? What are they after? And we usually look at, well, they're either trying to gain attention, they're trying to escape a demand, the teacher's asking them to do something, or you're asking them to do something, they don't want to do it, or they're wanting a tangible thing, something that they can have. In this case, Shirley McLean wanted attention from the nurse, but not because she cared about attention from the nurse, because ultimately she wanted a tangible thing. She wanted the shot. The shot had value to her. This course of events where we have a motivation, a motivating operation is the technical term, a strong desire to have something that gives value to this outcome. We have an antecedent, like, oh, it's time, I'm supposed to get it. We have the behavior, and then what's the payoff? Well, when I asked for it nicely, I didn't get it. When I got a little bit more aggressive, I didn't get it. When I had a full-out rage burst, I got it. What happens now is that this particular behavior is going to be strengthened. And it's not going to take very long for this character, the Shirley MacLaine character, to move into this rage burst any time she senses that she's not going to get what she wants. Do you all predict that next time she's going to go right into a demanding rage burst? Probably so. It works. And so with your own kids, it's really important for you to be sensitive to what is it that my kid is after right now? And what are they doing to get it? Am I, in fact, shaping or teaching my child to go into a rage burst in order to get the thing that is so important to them in this moment? And it doesn't matter how important it is to you or to me. It's important to them. So this paradigm is going to be extremely relevant in how you handle the day-to-day, moment-to-moment interactions where your child wants something. And how often does that happen, that your child may want something during the course of a day? Constantly. And if they want something and certain behaviors gain the access to that thing, whatever it was that they had to do to get what they want, that is going to be cemented into their repertoire. And it almost becomes something that people say, well, that's her personality. It's not a child's personality. It's what they've learned they have to do to get that response that they're after. Let's take a quick look at another way that that might look. Lenny, 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 I don't care what you think. Did they say that? You're going to have to be a lot more forceful with them. Lenny, are you? Lenny, listen, Lenny, Lenny, shut up a moment here. I am in serious trouble here. I can't get to these cards. I can't get the money. Do you understand that? My loan is past due. Look, I'll call the loan off. Lenny. Nope. Lenny, just, just listen. I'll be in LAX in three hours, okay? Now, remember, the Buick is an A3 main terminal. Make sure they pick it up. All right, well, all right, we'll see you in a few. I don't know what that means, skipping over damage area. Oops. I don't know what happened. You know, this is what happened when that guy walked by and it got all pixelated. Okay. Now, how one handles stress depends on what one has. How I handle the next few moments is going to demonstrate <laughs> repertoires, what I learned. Okay, I am going to escape this. 
not good. I'm going to get out of this. That's all right. You know what? We're just going to get out of it, and we're going to move on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to describe what the other way that this, this particular course of events can look. So I, it, it won't be as amusing, but it'll be me. What the other video shows, it's the old Rain Man episode where he wants to get on the airplane. And, I mean, he does not. The, um, Tom Cruise wants to get on the airplane. But the Dustin Hoffman character, Rain Man, does not want to get on. And he's actually afraid of airplanes. So when he says, we're going to get on the plane, the Dustin Hoffman character, the Rain Man character, starts to use self-injurious behavior. He starts screaming. It's like, ah! like that. And he's hitting his head, and he's screaming loud. They're in the airport. And the Tom Cruise character is like, OK, OK, no, no, OK. We're not going to get on the plane. We're not getting on the plane. Everybody, it's OK. He's OK. We're not getting on the airplane. And they leave. That's the essential storyline. In terms of this paradigm, you can see the similarity. What the character of, uh, her name is Aurora in the terms of endearment, but what the Shirley MacLaine character does is she has a rage burst in order to obtain a shot. You can have a rage burst to get something you want, and you can easily have the same kind of rage burst to avoid something that you don't want. In either scenario, it's critical that that payoff does not occur and is not given consequent to that particular behavior. If it is, that child learns to become disruptive at that strong level in order to obtain what they want. Very common scenario. The, the core of of why this is so critical to understand is that this is not your child alone. This is not a child that has a disorder or a disease. That is human behavior. That's how we are all programmed. When we're thwarted from what the outcome is that we need, we tend to dis display disruptive behavior rather than calm behavior, disruptive, aggressive, and rageful behavior to push people into action. And if you are a parent who is pushed into action because your child is showing disruptive, aggressive, disagreeable behavior, sometimes it doesn't have to reach the level of aggression. It can be simply something we call perseveration. When are we going to go? When are we going to go? You said we were going to go. When are you going to go? When are we going to go? A little disclosure uh, of my own. So I have a son with Tourette syndrome. And one of the features of Tourette syndrome is perseveration. It's kind of an OCD-linked kind of behavior where we fixate. How many of you have kids where fixating on a topic, or even a, it can be even a word, is an issue? OK, most of you. So I'm going to talk about this for a moment here. Fixating is a brain-based behavior. It is neurologically based. And you will see people with a variety of neurological condition, conditions showing this fixation, the uh, we sometimes call perseveration. And it can take different forms. So sometimes fixation or perseveration could be on a topic. Child wants to go to the zoo, go to the zoo, go to the zoo, call somebody, call grandma, call grandma. That's a topic kind of perseveration. It can also take the form of simply a repetitive action, even fixating on a word. So it can take different forms, but it stems from the same kind of compulsive, repetitive behavior. And I am going to give you some interventions on how to deal with that repetitive behavior. But it still goes along with a functional assessment that says, I want what I want. And that repetitive behavior, that perseveration has a payoff at the end of it. And the payoff, the desired behavior, is generally not the thing the kid is asking for. And that's what's interesting. Those of you who raised your hand, I really want to get your feedback on this. Often I find that when a child perseverates on something, even when they then get the thing that they were perseverating on, they continue to demonstrate that type of 
fixated behavior. In other words, it doesn't resolve immediately as soon as I get it. Raise your hand if your child is satisfied and ends the behavior abruptly if they get the thing that they're fixated on. Is that completely erase then the perseveration? Or do they continue to fixate? Continue to fixate. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later when I talk about intervention. But what that leads to is the relationship between biological tendencies and your child's typical performance in terms of their behavioral repertoires and what we do about it. So for a moment, people who have any kind of neurological difference, such as my son who has Tourette's syndrome, will have a set of symptoms that are not necessarily those of typical kids. And they present a set of difficulties in dealing with those behaviors, mostly because of the obscureness or the low level of the trigger, like what it takes to get them going, it takes less. Other kids may be fine with a certain type of condition and go with the flow. But a child with a neurological disorder or a biologically based behavior, the trigger can sometimes be something very minor. So the trigger is different. Also, the duration and intensity of their behavioral repertoire is so much higher that it looks like a completely different behavior. The good news on that is it still follows the natural principles, the natural laws of what governs anybody's behavior. So I think it's important for us to look at then how can we distinguish between an AHC, really neurologically based tantrum, and what I just showed you in that clip from um, Terms of Endearment. There are three markers for a rage that is not of the typical learned, I can control it, you can change this, and you can influence me. But that neurologically based rage that really is not sensitive to change. And these are the three markers. The first is that it follows a very specific course with a beginning, a middle, and an end that is the same every time. So it'll start up a certain way, it reaches a peak, and then it extinguishes in the same way each time. The second this is the one with AHC. This is the, I'm now going to describe a, an episode or a tantrum that is purely neurological. It's not learned. It's not just a kid kind of being naughty. It's not anything that you have contributed to or that we can kind of teach them out of. It is truly a neurological moment. And these can even be brought on by side effects to medication. There are, there are medications that can evoke these kind of tantrums. And one of the, we're do, going to be doing this behavioral study, I don't know how much has been talked about that, where I am going to actually get, give you questions about this very differentiation between the neurological type of tantrum versus this is a learned situation that we have a great deal of influence over. So again, back to the neurological one where we have, I wouldn't say no influence, but it's very minimal. It's much more brain-based. So it's going to have this very similar beginning, middle, end. And this is the, the next two are very critical. It's what we call stereotypic, meaning it always looks the same. It doesn't change given different situations. It's going to be very similar. And the third, and this is one that you actually can test. I'm going to give you a little test so that you can actually do a probe of your own. Is my kid just kind of, this is typical kid behavior and we need to deal with it? Or is this not something that my child's going to learn from? And that test is, is the child responding at all to their environment? So if I intrude, does the child change what they're doing? Even to the point of, do they just look up? Are they maybe throwing something and if I go, 
voila! <laughs> Will they kind of look and see the reaction? Then it's not part of a pure neurological situation. It's, it's part of what we call an operant, or it's learned. It can be changed. It can be modified. If a child is having this rage, and it might be just screaming, well, in the clip, she screamed, and then when she got, when the woman went in the room, what did she do? She snapped out of it. Oh, thank you very much. That's clearly a behavior that she has control over. So if you probe your child, and just even do something small, like um, hand them a pillow and say, put that there. Do they stop the rage and respond to that direction? Then we know, oh, wow, I got a lot of influence here. This is one of those that we can change. Even biologically based tantrums can be modified to a degree, but to a lesser degree. So moving along, I'm going to, I'm sorry that I couldn't show you that. I, can I put this down? All right. What I want to show you, what I'm having to do is access that video in a different place. And okay. What I want to do is I want to sh I want to flip over to some interventions for a moment. That tantrum that Shirley MacLaine had, she was reinforced for the tantrum because the woman gave her what she wanted immediately. This. It's funny because it's the same. It's Shirley MacLaine yet again, and she's older, and she's still awful. <laughs> she didn't learn a lesson. But this shows a simple intervention that's going to be the start of what I show you for the rest of this our session. So here we go. the engine. Start the engine. Earl. Yes, ma'am. Do you like your job? Yes, ma'am, a lot. Mrs. Carlisle, the protectee, is never allowed to sit directly behind the driver. That's a regulation. Nobody does it. Not the president. Not anybody. The sun will be on that side, and I do not want to Perhaps you could sit on the proper side, but slightly then to the middle. Nope. Ma'am, excuse me, but we are not leaving this house until you are seated properly with your seatbelt firmly fastened. Jesus Christ, let her sit on the hood if she wants to. This is where we give in. <laughs> Move it out, Earl. We're rolling. Oh, God, these family outings are always so stressful. Okay, that's the first part of differential reinforcement, which is going to be the cornerstone of the techniques I give you today, which is we make a demand. That's Shirley MacLaine. I'm going to sit on this side. It's part of a whole repertoire of control taking. I don't know how important the song is really to her, but it's very important that she gets her way. This is the kind of repertoire that we don't want our children to start to develop. This is the first person probably in her life that actually knew how to handle her. The beauty of it is that 
There's no yelling. There's no putting in a timeout room. There's no restraining. It is a quiet, it is a simple and respectful way of reshaping a repertoire. It is called differential reinforcement, meaning I'm going to reinforce you, your behavior, when it conforms to the minimum of what my expectation is. When you do what you need to do, that's when we move on. That's when I give you what you need. The key is that you notice he didn't say to her, good girl, or thank you for doing what I asked you to do. He didn't do that. The reward is we're moving on. And as I progress with the intervention, I want to emphasize that it's extremely important that we don't get too hooked into this trend nowadays where everything is supposed to be praised. Good sitting up, good looking, good you know, sneezing, good breathing, good, oh, I like the way you said that. I like, now, I am for flooding reinforcement. So I'm not saying don't praise your child, but I think there's a kind of a reinforcement that is going to track better with your child, particularly children who struggle with their body responses motorically, kids who struggle with daily care, with ambulation. Kids who struggle with those basic functions need to feel that they are competent. Their payoff isn't just that mommy loves me or mommy approves of me or daddy thinks I'm terrific, daddy thinks I'm adorable. Those are great, but they do not supplant the basic drive that your child has. And the basic drive is to be a doer, a competent person who has mastery over their environment. They want to be able to make things happen. That is a human need. When kids have a disease like AHC, like cerebral palsy, like myoclonus, I've had quite a few kids who have motor impairments, motor disorders that have Kinsborn syndrome, that have disorders that are related to motor action. Those are kids that feel the frustration and pain of incompetence of frustration that they cannot do things more than any other child. That goes in that motivating operations piece of things. The backdrop is their baseline of frustration is already high. Other kids enter situations with no baseline of frustration. They you know they want they pull they want to pull up a chair, they pull up the chair. They want to run, they run. They want to pull something down, they grab it down. They want to talk, they talk and they don't even think about it. Their baseline is so much lower. Your kids come to situations with a baseline of frustration that other kids don't. That goes to that MO part, that motivating operations. It makes what I want so much more intense. And it also gives them a, a more minimal repertoire of, well, what can I do to get what I want? And if rage works, that is an efficient, effective and easy behavior to pull up. If I get it, fa the faster I get it, what was it that made that, that worked real fast? The screaming, that worked fast. It sure works a lot more efficiently than having to use words, having to wait, not knowing if I'm going to get it or not, the patience, all oh, that's really hard. Why would your child pull up those behaviors when it's much easier to pull up a rage burst if in fact those bursts work. So it's very important that we also build a sense of competence and mastery with our kids. And how do we do that? The payoff isn't just praise. The payoff is ha helping the child make things work. So if they want something, let's even say it's as simple as a juice box. Rather than doing more for them than they need. I'm going to assess what's the level of caregiving that they require, and I'm only going to give that level. I am not going to give any more. 
what happens when we care give children who have these kinds of, of disabilities is that we tend to then over care give. We do things for them. We get into a mode. We, as parents and caregivers, we're also affected by behavior in the environment. And so we get into a caregiving mode that then we do for the child. We're constantly doing for them. We're positioning them. And that deprives them of the sense of competence and effectiveness that is the huge payoff. And so this little cook where he was just quiet, the payoff for her didn't have to do with competence, but the payoff was she went to go shopping. So he didn't say, good girl, you listen to me, you followed the rule. He said, we're rolling. And so I encourage you to think about reinforcement in terms of what is my child after and how can they get what they're after in a way that is constructive. I want the screaming. Screaming really is never should never work. I suppose if they're screaming because there's something hot on them, <laughs> then it's going to work. But other than emergency situations, don't let a burst or, or a rage burst actually bring about payoff. That's, that is a, a real problem because now you have confusion about whether this outburst is in fact purely neurological or if I kind of taught my child halfway to do this. So that's an important distinction. I'm going to give you the methodology in four steps. And the first step, I'm going to backtrack a little bit, is called it's CR, it's called being a conditioned reinforcer. I'm not going to, I'm having trouble writing a little bit on this. So conditioned reinforcer. You are going to be, you the parent, here's what this means. And I, you can start this today. You need to pair yourself up with things that your child enjoys and loves. So you need to have little gambits and interactions that are fun, stimulating, and enjoyable. And they have to come through you. So that if you have a really young child, I'm going to definitely, I'm going to pull out bubbles. I'm just going to play with my child and bring joy. I want to make sure that when my child sees me coming, they may also be thinking, oh, she may be wanting, wanting me to do something. There may be a demand. But I want the child to feel like something good may be coming, something fun may be coming. Now, I'll tell you where I messed up once, and it really made it clear. I was going to um, a house where a little girl who um, had another, actually kind of a rare myoclonus uh, disorder, but she had a phobia uh, of the bathroom. So she could not go to school because she was not potty trained at all. She was a little, a little bit older. And I came to the house with a clipboard and um, a pen. I think I had a pen in my hand. And I walked, I rang the bell, and she opened the door, and she looked at me like, and she ran. And she hid behind the couch. And I thought, how stupid of me. I'm holding, the, I look like teacher, going to make you do work. We're going to work at the table. She immediately saw me, and I was what's called a conditioned punisher. She thought, uh-oh, my life's going to get worse real fast. And she ran. That told me, oh my goodness, of course, I need to first condition myself as a reinforcer. So I put those things back in the car, came back in, asked the mom, what does she love? And she gave me this big bag of candy. And I stood there eating it myself, just eating the candy. She's eating my bag of candy. You know, she's doing, and I'm eating. And she came out to kind of investigate. And I took a piece of candy out. And I just held my hand. I didn't even look at her. I held my hand out like that, and she grabbed it. And we just kept doing this. The key is no demands. I just offered candy. I paired myself instead of work lady as candy lady. I want you to condition yourselves as fun mom, fun dad. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean you don't put any uh, restrictions and limits? Uh-uh. That's just half of the story. But if you're not also paired up with an expectation that when they see you that things might be fun, then you're not going to have any traction when you start to put in the demand. So we have to start out conditioning yourself and making sure that you pair yourself up with fun. That's kind of the backdrop. 
The second part is the meat of what we do. And that has to do with teaching. So the teaching component is inclusive of this differential reinforcement. So we reinforce certain things, reinforce desired behaviors, but it's more than that. It's also teaching to deficits. So that I want you to take the question of how do I stop my child from doing these things I don't like. I don't, you know when parents come to me and they say, well, my child spits. My child has this weird habit of breaking glass. These are real behaviors. My first question in my own head is, okay, not, well, how do we stop the child from spitting? That's not the question I ask. I turn the question upside down. And I think, what do I want the child to do instead? What is it that they need to do at this moment instead of that? And how do I make that work? So I'm going to give you an example of a little girl who has um, developmental disabilities. Okay. Hopefully this will work. <laughs> This little girl has developmental disabilities, and the behavior was that she screams. She shrieks and screams all day long. She does it more when she's excited with the iPad, but she does it all day. They went to a pediatric uh, physician who actually told the family, you can't stop the screaming. First of all, it drives everybody in the house batty after a while. He said, you can't stop the screaming. It's like telling a dog, don't wag your tail. This is the answer that they got. And I said, well, you know what? I can actually stop a dog from wagging its tail by having it sit. Oh, it might go a little like that. But you actually can do just about anything by looking at, OK, well, wait a minute. How can we teach the child to inhibit the screaming? Not, oh, how do we make her stop? When she says, stop it, quiet, that's not going to work. So you set up a teaching component. I want you to leave here knowing that when I see a, a behavior in my child that is maladaptive, inappropriate, something I, I don't want, what I want you to think of, OK, wait a minute, what is it that I really need her to do? And so I asked a different question. How can what I need is for Betsy, this is the little girl, to be able to look at her iPad with a quieter voice. Once you translate the I don't want this question into, well, what do I do want? Once you put it in the framework of a goal, now it's a teaching moment. We now can teach her to do something different. So I want you to take a look at this. Her mom. Hey, you okay? <laughs> Is that? Hey. Mm -hmm. okay. Borderline. Modulated it. Hey, you are leaving it really nice and quiet. Yeah. Okay, that's too loud. That's too loud. Betsy. Okay, she removes the the stimulus, which is her reinforcer. The treats are just an added beef it up. If we just take it away, see, she won't learn. Some more iPads. Why don't you use your quiet voice? You see quiet voice? That's right. Now I know you saw it. Okay. Nice and quiet. Now we try again. Okay. Got a girl. 
Do you remember how to make it bigger? There you go. Like it's upside down. What are you going to do? Bad girl. Turn it so it's right. Now I'm hearing more quiet talking. Now I'm hearing quiet talking. Okay. I think you get the idea. What we're doing is we're teaching the child to be in the presence of this provoking stimulus, the iPad, which makes her scream. Now this is probably the fourth session or so that you're seeing here. That make that evokes the screaming. It's a trigger. So this iPad is a trigger for the unwanted behavior, which is loud, sustained shrieking. We're teaching her Instead of just taking it away and saying, okay, you can't have it, that's not teaching her anything. We need to teach her to have it with a quiet voice. And we did it by using the presence and withdrawal of the iPad contingent on a certain decibel level of her voice. The beautiful thing is, I've seen her, this is probably a couple years later, she doesn't scream and we were able to generalize it. So we went from the iPad to another screen TV. Then we took it to the car because that was another provoking trigger, was being in the car. Oh my God, they could hardly drive the car. So we took it to the car. We started generalizing her using a soft voice under various conditions. So that now screaming occurs very seldom. Does it still happen here and there? Yeah, but very, very seldom. And it's certainly not throughout the day like it had been. So in my, in my world, Behaviors are taught. Good behavior is taught like a skill. Last night I used the example with a few of the moms where, can you imagine a group of first graders? Well, now they teach reading in kindergarten, so let's just say kindergartners. And the teacher says, okay, kids, and they lay out books. They say, all right, read. Go to it. Let's read. And then when no child reads, they would say, you go in time out and you think about why you're not reading. And then you come back and you try again. It's absurd. We know that certain repertoires have to be taught as a skill. You wouldn't expect a child to simply perform the behavior with no teaching for anything except behavior, politeness. That would be, that's the only skill set that we don't view or teach as a skill. So I'm going to hurry things along. Sorry to be slow. All right. So the teaching component, the reinforcing desired behavior throughout the day. When you see your child doing things that are correct, the world is theirs. Give them what they, you know, I mean, obviously with some limitations, but they're entitled. They're, it's like they're eligible as long as they're behaving politely. And I like to think of it as polite behavior. That's kind of my goal. They're polite, then they're eligible for things that they want. When they become demanding, negative, hostile, irritable, throwing things, then they, they, are not going to have any payoff whatsoever, and you're going to be like Nicolas Cage. You're going to block that. The last thing is the reactive. I'm kind of in a hurry here. The reactive. In other words, the consequences. So I'm going to quickly, for the interest of time, I don't want to leave this part out, I'm going to give you what I think is the best, I, I, in a way, it's, it could be called discipline, but the best kind of con set of consequences for behaviors that are disruptive. Remember that the first thing you do is shutting down things. So the way Nicolas Cage has shut it down. And if you can shut down, wait for the right response, and then move forward, that is for low-level behaviors, it's actually the best thing you can do. It's the best teacher is to not do anything until that child demonstrates a little bit of what you want and then we get going. 
but sometimes kids do things that need a consequence. So I think you might recognize this little girl coming up. So here we have, these, these are very, very brief, like only seconds, actually. It was real quick, part of a, a little burst. Now, here's mom putting in place the plan, which is the post-it plan, it's our chore plan. So what she does is, she puts up a post-it note. <laughs> Did you hear that? No. <laughs> I could hear, that's the first time I've heard that. I don't know if you could you hear when the post-it note went up, you could hear Kylie in the background going, no. <laughs> Here's what the post-it plan is. It's a delayed consequence. But the by marking it in the moment, it it actually can act as an immediate consequence. It kind of bridges, that post-it note bridges the immediacy of a consequence with we might not be able to actually do the full consequence till later, but simply by sticking that short sticky up there, it bridges it. So what we can do is we let her know, okay, you have an outburst, we're going to ignore that. But when you start to throw chairs or uh, hurt somebody, you've crossed that line. The post-it note goes up, which marks there's a chore. And later on, we get the corners. <laughs> OK, here she is. She's, and, and the benefit is clean floors. Get the corners. <laughs> OK, it's really quick. So I recommend that instead of using a lot of stuff that, uh, like taking away this and taking away that, or um, yelling, okay, I recommend staying calm, staying quiet. It's easier to do when you know that you have, that there is going to be accountability. So we don't hold kids accountable for having episodes, obviously. But we do hold kids accountable for voluntary behaviors that are disruptive or hurtful to others, like throwing things, hitting people, the aggressive components. And what we do is we do it in a somewhat benign way, but it's effortful. So the effort that you expend in hitting somebody or throwing a chair, well, there's a little price tag to that. We mark it, and at a later point in time, not right in that moment, but in a late, could even be the next day, could be later that day, the child then is going to do helpful chores. They're going to actually do something constructive to, to make restitution for what they did wrong. So that is kind of a system that I think works well, and it particularly works well with kids with AHC for this reason. I don't like the idea of adding more provocation and triggers to an already excited and triggered child. So you have a child with AHC, they are much more likely to be triggered by anxiety and stress. Keep the stress level low, and yet hold them accountable for being polite members of the family. They, they shouldn't feel that they're exempt from the human reciprocal laws, that we, the social laws that we all value. They're not exempt from that. But the way to teach them is to give them whatever little teaching component is necessary so that we're actually giving them, their, they're getting the skill. You can't expect them to demonstrate a skill they don't have. So you teach the behavioral skill. You hold them accountable in a very low-key, neutral way that lets them know, you know, that was hindering. I have a motto in my family called everything to help and nothing to hinder. I suggest it to my families because it's a beautiful sentiment 
and it frames all of this. When you, when you were upset and when you threw that chair, that hindered. When you hit me or called me a name, that hinders. Now you can use the word hurt instead of hinder if you wish. But we teach children that, well, when you hurt others or you hurt the home, then we have to do things that help. So even in the consequence, you're teaching some positive value. We believe in helping in this family. When you were mad and you were throwing things or spitting at me or scratching your sister or whatever that is, that wasn't helping. So later, when everybody's calm, we're going to, we have three post-it notes up here. We're going to do three helping things. And you're there with your child helping them to do that. And those helping things can be anything based on the developmental level of your child. I think we're, are we out of time? Did you, yeah, okay. So, well, here's the thing. Okay, I will answer some questions. What I'd like to do is answer clarification questions now. And tomorrow we have a session that is pure, that's question q and A. I I will answer all of your specific questions tomorrow. Is that a good compliment? Okay. So are there questions here that are clarification questions? Get your mic. Um, do you think that some of these uh, behaviors are under their control? Okay, that's uh, a great question. Because I, you know, they I, seem I see like they're two not. types yeah. of behaviors. I see the bratty behavior, like actually yeah. kept bugging Bill today at the table. You know, <laughs> yeah. he, he wanted him to say something. Uh, or we wanted to ask him a question, but it was just you know, it was just being annoying. Right. But then there's the other that's just like a like a sudden, like out of like their control. volatile like, right. thing that I mean, no amount of violence on my part or or you know punishment of nothing's going to change that. No, you, is going to stop it or even change. Yeah, I think you, you hit a, the critical point is right there. Where's that difference? And so I, I think you're right. The, and I like what you said it too. The bratty behavior, great. This is the system to use and there's no question about it. When the behavior seemed to be out of the person's control, I might do a little probe, and I think that was suggested in the earlier um, training also uh, it, by the doctor where he said you can kind of probe a little bit. Remember when he said if, if this, to see whether it's truly a seizure, you can kind of probe to see if the person is responsive to what you're saying. And that was in regard to seizures. I would say the same thing in regard to is this something where they are in a zone, you know, they're out of control and there's no amount of consequences or in, interruption or intervention that's going to even help this. Do a probe and kind of insert something like, um, oh, here, take this and hand them a tissue or some sort of benign in intrusion. If they stop and actually respond to your intrusion, then you will have some traction with this. If they don't, here's what I recommend. I recommend simply having a safe place in your home for that person to go through that course that I described earlier, the rage course, and let it fizzle out. Monitoring that person to make sure that they're not in any kind of medical distress. But you're monitoring them, don't leave them alone. But when a person's in that kind of mode where there's no amount of intervention, they're not responsive, basically. That's a time to simply have the person have a cozy corner, you know, have them in a safe place, maybe a mattress, maybe a blanket, whatever they need to do to go to sleep, to rest, to get through it with, I would say, no interaction. Because when you, other than the probe to make sure that you know what you're dealing with, other than that probe, trying to get a person to stop or relax or quiet down makes it worse. So if a person is truly in a zone of a rage burst and you say to them, you know, calm down, quiet, you're okay, that actually makes the situation worse because you're adding stimulation. 
So when I see a kid that I feel is in that out of control kind of, uh, an ep I don't want to call it an episode, but an out of control outburst, what I do is I lower the stimulation. I might even dim the lights. I low, make sure you turn off sound, TV, radio. Get it quiet and let them have as little to no stimulation as possible to get through it. And I would not hold them accountable for that type of in the zone, totally neurologic rage burst. But if there is, when a person picks up a chair, now I don't think it's just that. When a person actually has a set of behaviors that are, that are highly related to the environment and highly variable, like this time they're, oh, so I'm going to get you, and you're going to chair and they fling it. That to me is, a, is more of this type of uh, burst that is learned, that is operant, and that you can actually teach something. You can teach them to not do that. So I think that was a very important question. Anything else? Do we have time for one more? Yes? Um, I have a friend whose child can't communicate back. How do you um, teach that to a child that can't communicate back and you can't do the chores? He's non-ambulatory and there's no post-it or you can't do a chore thing for a consequence. Or right. So, so we look at where is, well, I think I still need to ask her a question. <laughs> OK. So you're asking when when the the child has an extremely limited physical ability, including language, how do we hold that child accountable? And I think we have to look at what kinds of things the child actually does have the ability to do. Can they is the child completely immobilized and there's absolutely nothing that that child can do? Can they um, you can press like a button to make a choice. Um, he, he uses a wheelchair. Could you ambulate. talk into oh, yeah. He uses a wheelchair. He doesn't ambulate. Okay. Um, he can cruise around, but he. Can okay, and I have worked switch. with kids who are in that kind of situation, and I think that's the kind of child where you go to the Nicolas Cage kind of thing, where you really you may not be able to do the the active effortful consequences. But what you do is you teach that child uh, to inhibit some of this aggressive behavior in order to access the things that they do want. And I would do the zero. I would okay. have no input. I would probably remove myself even socially. I would, I would withdraw. I know she's done that. OK. OK. okay. So she's probably on the right track. Okay. And I think we have. I will. You know, when it okay. comes to like, if though I what I would like is for people to think about an individual your situation. Do we I, have time for one more? Yes, I'm not going to be oh, here tomorrow. Yeah, okay. But I, yeah. I did want to say thank you so much for your okay. presentation because oh, I think you. one piece that is very important for the AHC community and the kids um, is the dignity, and I think that's what was presented today is that the dignity of the individual stays intact with this particular practice. And love and logic is one of, I'm not sure if you're I am with familiar, yes. 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 So that's one of the techniques that they use. So thank you it's so much. It's very similar. This. Thank you very much. And I want to give an example of that. Um, the last time I, was, I spoke, and I think it actually was probably the one before in San Francisco, there was a parent here, an AHC parent, who had their child at the table, who the child was getting to a point where they didn't want to be there anymore. And so she just started screaming. And the parents said, oh, we're, we're, we're kind of past our, our time. Let's, and she started to hurry her out. And that's when I said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Stop. And I told the child, it's, you want to go? And the child kind of was like looking. And it did not have a much communication. And I actually just kind of made do with this little, like a, I just drew a thing on a napkin. I said, touch the napkin. You want to go? Touch the napkin. And she kind of touched the napkin. I go, OK. Now we go. Why I put inserted that little thing is, we're going to go. We see you've had enough. But if loud screaming is what gets us to rush around and do it, we've actually taught you, OK, honey, every time you want to go, you know what you have to do? You have to really be loud and screaming, and then we know that you want to go. Rather than saying, hold on, Communicate this. I don't care if it's a nod. I don't care if she touches something, if it's a little communication button. But that's what works. 
that's how this kind of thing works. We're, okay, we'll go, but not from that. We'll go from something that is constructive, something that goes back to a little more polite than what you did, and make that be effective, make that work. Then that restores the dignity of the person, and we avoid being partners and sort of teaching the wrong thing. So thank you. I'm sorry you won't be here tomorrow, but okay. Thank you.